In this video, we're going to look at a maximum payload minimum fuel backwards plan. It's a high possibility that you'll get one of these questions in the exam. So a little bit harder than the other backwards plans we looked at. This one is more or less the same process, but we have to estimate a landing weight to begin with. And then we correct that landing weight in the end. So only an extra couple of steps, but throws a few people off. So make sure you feel really comfortable with this before moving on to abnormal operations. The question we're going to be doing is the first max payload min fuel question from the textbook. It's a flight from Brisbane to Sydney. I've given you the route details, so I've given you the track and the distance. We're to cruise at an optimum flight level. We're to consider normal operations only and carry minimum fuel required at brakes release. We've been given an aircraft basic weight of 47.2 tonne. That's not actually really relevant in this question. It goes on to say carry the maximum payload possible. We'll talk about that in a second. Plan to cruise at uh, Mark 0.8 cruise schedule. We have some route sector winds and temps, nice and easy, just from Brisbane to Sydney. Both Brisbane and Sydney are suitable for our uh, use during the times required. We want to know what is the brakes release weight at Brisbane. Now, the deal with this maximum payload possible in the question. For these maximum payload minimum fuel flight plans, in order to get the most amount of payload, the maximum amount of payload, the aircraft has to be loaded to its maximum zero fuel weight. You can never get more payload than an aircraft that's loaded to its maximum zero fuel weight. So to estimate the landing weight, we have to think what will be on board at landing. We obviously have the weight of the aircraft, which they've given us is 47.2 tonne. Again, we don't actually need that figure and you'll see why in a second. We also have the payload, we have some fuel on board. We don't land with empty tanks. We're going to have some reserves on board. So it essentially comes down to on board the aircraft at landing is the zero fuel weight or a plane without fuel plus reserves. Now, in order to get the maximum payload, we said we have to be loaded to the maximum zero fuel weight of the aircraft, which is 63,500 kilos. So to estimate the landing weight here, we need to start with a maximum zero fuel weight of 63,500 and add on reserves. Now there's a couple of easy ones. We know what's going to be on board. We know we're going to have fixed reserve, which is 3,300 kilos. On landing, we're still going to have the taxi in fuel, which is 100. We're also going to have variable reserve on board. Now this is the one that's a little bit more complicated. The others are, are fixed numbers. They don't change. The variable reserve does change from flight to flight. By this stage, you'd probably be pretty familiar with how to estimate flight fuel, which means we can estimate a variable reserve. I've given you a distance here. And I've told you we're cruising Mark 0.8, which is an SAR of 9.5. So we can easily estimate the amount of flight fuel. Go 418 times 9.5 plus our climb allowance of 1600 gives us an estimated flight fuel of 5571, which means we can estimate our variable reserve of 557, just 10% of our flight fuel. So let's add that onto the weight of the aircraft. That's all that we're going to have on board on landing. So we estimate our landing weight to be 67,457 kilos. And this is the landing weight we start our flight plan at. And then we work backwards. And at the end, we can correct this landing weight to make a more accurate landing weight, which means we can estimate a more accurate brakes release weight. We won't have to do a whole nother flight plan, but you'll see when we get there, it's actually pretty easy to correct the brakes release weight as well. So let's start this flight plan, Brisbane, Sydney, with a landing weight of 67,457 kilos. I'll start by writing up the flight plan. We'll go from Brisbane, top of climb, top of descent, Sydney with an approach. Now notice I haven't put a fix in there that's two to 300 miles away from the departure point. The reason for that is Brisbane to Sydney is such a short leg, 418 miles. We're probably going to use 150, 200 miles in the climb, which only leaves two to 250 miles left in the cruise. So our top of descent position is within that two to 300 mile range for departure. So like any other flight plan, the other question we need ourselves on top of how we're going to break up the flight plan is what level we're going to fly at. No, we're climbing to uh, top of climb and descending into Sydney. What level are we going to fly at? Well, it's told us to fly at an optimum altitude. So let's work out what this optimum altitude is. We need a mid zone weight for the flight, which is really easy for these backwards plan. Usually we'd half the distance times it by SAR plus 1600 and subtract that from a brakes release weight. 
Now we just have to half the distance times about SAR and add it on to landing weight. We don't have to worry about a climb allowance because we're not climbing on the second half of the flight. So I'm going to go 418 miles divided by 2 times an SAR of 9.5. That gives us 1,985.5. We'll add that to our landing weight of 67,457. Gives us an estimated mid zone weight of 69,442.5. So we'll call that 69.4 for the sake of the altitude capability table. So we go to page 2-14, we'll look in the optimum altitude column for Westley tracks because we're flying a track of 183. So 390, we want to be close to 55.3. Yeah, we're a fair way off that. 350, we want to be close to 67.4 as I'm looking at the mark 0.8 row here as well. 67.4 and we're 69.5. That's look on 310, we have to be 81.6. So that's quite far away. At this stage, it looks like 350 is our optimum. We do have to check that we can actually achieve flight level 350 as well. So to estimate our top of climb position, or our top of climb weight, which is what we're going to be using to work out if we can actually achieve the level, just 418 times 9.5 plus 1600, and we'll add that onto our landing weight. This is going to give us a brakes release weight. Brakes release weight comes out to be 73,028 kilos. To work out top of climb, we'll just take off 3,000 kilos. That gives us 70,028 kilo rough top of climb weight. So let's check 2-14, make sure we can actually achieve it. Looking at flow level 350, mark 0.8 row on the ISA column because it looks like the ISA deviation at that level is plus 1. It says we have to be at or less than 76 ton. We're actually expecting to be about 70 tons, so we're quite dramatically less than that. So we don't have to check climb figures and we can definitely achieve flow level 350. So it looks like 350 is going to be the uh, altitude for us. Let's continue on going left to right, top to bottom, filling as much information as we can. I'll do that all the way to ground speed, and then we'll continue uh, talking about the question. All right, I'm up to ground speed. We'll stop, have a think, what are we going to do next? So given this is a backwards plan, the next thing we need to do is write down our landing weight and start working our way up. So we know we estimate our landing weight as 67,457 kilos. We know we're going to use 400 kilos for approach, which gives us arrival at the airport of 67,857. Let's go ahead and find descent data from flight level 350. Looking in the manual, you'll find the ETI is 23 minutes, the zone fuel of 680 kilos, and an air distance of 119 miles. Calculating the ground speed, you'll find it's 121.3, and we can easily work out our top of descent weight just by adding 67,000. 857 plus our 680 kilo descent fuel gives top of descent weight of 68,537. Alright, the next thing to do is to calculate the climb data. We don't know the cruise distance, so we're not going to be able to do that. Similar to the other backwards plans, we have to estimate a brakes release weight in order to get that climb data. Now we know the total distance of the flight is 418 of which 121.3 is descent. That means the remaining distance is 296.7 miles. Let's estimate our brakes release weight with that. We'll times that distance by 9.5, add on 1600 kilos for climb allowance, and then add that to our top of descent weight. That gives us an estimated brakes release weight of 72,955.7 kilos. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what column would we use for climb data with a brakes release weight of 72,955? The answer is we'd use 72 ton data. So now we can go find climb data for 72 ton, and then after that we can find the cruise distance to top climb. So for an ice a day, climb to flight level 350 with a brakes release weight of 72 ton. We're going to climb for 22 minutes, cover 136 air miles, 
and burn 2,750 kilos of fuel. The Grand Nordic Miles with an 8 knot tailwind for 22 minutes comes to 138.9. That means the remaining distance in the cruise is 157.8 miles. We'll treat this like any other normal cruise leg by working out the estimated mid zone weight. Going 0.02 times the wind component, 22. Because it's a tailwind, we'll subtract that from our SAR. We'll multiply this by our distance, divided by 2, and then add that onto our weight to top of the cent. That gives us an estimated mid zone weight of 69 tonne. We'll go get the fuel flow for 69 tonne, flight level 350. Then we'll work out an ETI. The ETI comes out to be 19.6 minutes. And the zone fuel comes out to be 1,301.8. Adding that onto our top of descent weight gives us a top of climb weight of 69,838.8. We'll add these two together to make sure the mid zone weight checks out, which it does. 69 tonne is the correct mid zone weight. We can then go add on our climb data to work out a more accurate brakes release weight. So 69,838.8 plus the climb fuel of 2750 gives us a brakes release weight of 72,588.8. Now just like the other backwards plans, we need to ask ourselves, did we use the correct climb data? Now given that we have a brakes release weight of 72,000 588, it means we did use the correct climb data because we're still using the 72 ton climb data. So that means all the calculations we've done are valid. Now that's not the final step for these maximum payload minimum fuel questions. There's one more step. The last step is to correct for the estimate. We originally estimated our landing weight was 67,457 kilos. And that was based off an estimated variable reserve plus your fixed plus your taxi plus maximum zero fuel weight. We can now correct that. We know what the actual flight fuel is, meaning we know the actual variable reserve. So let's work out what the actual flight fuel is first. I've taken my landing weight off my brakes release weight and that's given me an actual flight fuel of 5,131.8. That means the actual variable reserve is 513. Decimal two, we'll call it. So to work out the actual brakes release weight, let's add these together. Flight fuel, variable reserve, we'll add on a fixed reserve, 3,300 kilos. We'll add on taxi in, so there's 100. And then we'll add on our maximum zero fuel weight like we did at the start. This gives us an actual brakes release weight of 72,545 kilos. And that's our actual brakes release weight for this question. You can see it's very, very similar to a normal backwards plan. We just have that extra step at the start and that extra step at the end. It's very, very common in this exam for people that are not super confident with these max payload min fuel questions to work backwards to a brakes release weight and just write that figure in. But that's not correct. That was based off an estimated landing weight. In order to get the question right, you need to go back and correct it like we've just done here. Now you can see it doesn't make a world of difference. It's about 40 kilos difference, but that might be make or break for the exam question. So it's really important to go back and correct it at the end.